And uh, what what a pleasure it is to see not only all the friendly, familiar faces, but to see some faces that uh, we haven't seen in a while, and uh, to see some fresh new faces. And in all these things, we're all in the same family. Yes, we have uh, what people would call membership in churches, but we're all of the same body. We're all of the same family. And uh, we're thankful that you're all here. And those of you who are watching online, thank you for making New Spirit your place of worship today. If you have your Bibles with you, if you'll turn to the book of Revelation, chapter 3, verses 1 through 6. Revelation, chapter 3, verses 1 through 6. We remind you also we have notebooks up there at the front. And we do encourage you to take notes. Uh, Mark and I have been bringing you a series on the book of Revelation. We work too hard to to let those ideas and concepts uh, be forgotten. So please, we encourage you to take notes. And if you need a notebook, they are free for you to come and, and uh, Brother Jose will, will give you one. If you can please stand in honor of God's word as we read today from Revelation chapter 3, verses 1 through 6. To the church in Sardis, and to the angel of the church in Sardis write the words of him who has the seven spirits of God and the seven stars. I know your works. You have the reputation of being alive, but you are dead. Wake up and strengthen what remains and is about to die, for I have not found your works complete in the sight of God. Remember then what you received and heard. Keep it and repent. If you will not wake up, I will come like a thief. And you will not know at what hour I will come against you. Yet you have still a few names in Sardis, people who have not soiled their garments, and they will walk with me in white, for they are worthy. The one who conquers will be clothed thus in white garments, and I will never blot his name out of the book of life. I will confess his name before my father and before his angels. He who has an ear, let him hear what the Spirit says to the churches. Lord, Father, I, I thank you for the overwhelming privilege to be here standing at your holy desk given permission and authority by you, Lord, to preach your word. Lord, I am unworthy. But Lord, Father, it is you that makes me worthy. And so, Lord, Father, I pray that every word be spoken according to your word, that your spirit speak through me. Lord, let this proclamation be a proclamation in love and always in truth. May those who hear it, may it receive life, wisdom, and the knowledge, Lord, that your word is always true. We thank you in Jesus' name. Amen. You may be seated. Thank you. I want to give you a list of some companies. And I want to ask you if you can tell me what these companies have in common. First one. I'm just going to give you the list. Pan American Airlines. Just keep that one in mind. Toys R Us. Blockbuster. How many of you remember Blockbuster? Am I old? Because there's some people looking at me like, what's that? Okay, good, thank you. Oldsmobile. What can you tell me these four companies have in common? No longer Bankrupt. Pan American Airlines went, went dead in 1991. Toys R Us at one point was the largest toy retailer outlet in the United States, and it made billions but poor leadership and spending led it to declare bankruptcy in 2017. Blockbuster, you won't believe this, but there's still one store and only one store open and it's found in Bend, Oregon. So if you do have a hankering to, to, to rent a DVD, you can drive over to Bend, Oregon or fly over there better and go to that Blockbuster. Or return one. Or return one. If you haven't returned your DVD, <laughs> You need to find a place to return it. There's where you could go. Thank you, brother. 
Oldsmobile was 106 years in business and at one point was one of the, was one of the most successful car companies. Went out of business in 2004. All of these companies were once alive. They're now dead. And with their success, when you find one thing in common, it's that they became indifferent in their success. They, for a while, began to just uh, live off of their reputation. They began to live off of their uh, success and they forgot what made them great in the first place. They became apathetic and indifferent. They forgot who they were and soon they died. And after today, I think we can add one other name to that list and that would be the church in Sardis. And as we continue this series, and I want to thank again my brother Mark for joining me in this series, on those seven churches, the letters to the seven churches, before I continue, I want to, I want to stress a very important point. I want to offer you a macro perspective on these seven letters as we continue. I want you to understand something. We will never understand the meaning and the purpose of these seven letters until we first understand the driving question, the driving question behind why Jesus is addressing these uh, churches in the first place. What is that driving question? What is the, the governing question that drives Jesus to, to uh, reach out to these churches and to deliver uh, directives and commands and instructions? And that question is this. How can we be right with God? That's the governing question. The driving question behind these seven letters is how can I be right with God? That should be the driving force in our lives. That should be the question that drives us every day. Lord, am I right with you? And if I'm not, how can I get right with you, Lord. And let me tell you something. That question applies not only to the individual, but to the church community as well. Do you see what I'm saying? Never, never can we come before the Lord and pose this question apart from our responsibility to the church. That we would come to the Lord standing alone and say, Lord, am I right with you? And God would look at us and say, Hmm, I don't know, where is your brethren? When we ask, am I right with God? We have a responsibility and are accountable to ask that question both individually and communally. We are never absolved of our obligation to ensure that our church community is also right with God. And Jesus makes this abundantly clear in these seven letters. If you if you hear nothing else of what Jesus is doing, is he's petitioning to a faithful or an unfaithful flock of followers as he and he's instructing them how to get right with God. Now, we can't just say, well, I'm okay with God. I'm doing good. I'm walking with the Lord. I'm reading my Bible. I'm doing all these great things in my church, not so much. Uh, the pastor, he's kind of wacky. He, he, he kind of says some off-the-cuff stuff. And there's some leaders there that are not walking faithful, faithfully with the Lord. The, the church is a little off, but, but I'm okay with God. We can't do that. We don't have that privilege. Because when we tolerate things that we know are wrong in the community, when we fail to correct wrong doctrine, when we turn a blind eye to sin, when we persist in a church that we know is not walking faithfully with the Lord, Jesus is saying that he's going to hold us accountable for it. And that is the occasion that gives rise to these letters. Jesus wants his bride to get right with God. And like a good shepherd, he's either encouraging those who are walking faithfully or he's guiding those who are not back to God. Some would look at people in the church and someone might even look at me and say, oh, pastor's all up in my business, man. He's always following up. He's always wanting to do this or that. It's not that. I love you, man. Amen. I, I want to make sure that you're right with God. Amen. And this church wants to make sure 
that you're right with God. Amen. And if we don't do that, then God is going to hold us accountable as a church. So we're not bugging you. We're not trying to, to control you. We're not trying to manipulate you. We love you. We want to make sure that you're right with God. That's our job. And as a pastor, I don't get to look at God and say, Lord, well, I'm doing good. My flock, uh, they've gone a little wayward. No, God says, feed my sheep. Guide my flock. And that's the job of the pastor and the, the deacons, the ministers that are here, the leaders. It's all of our job to encourage one another. So it's not just am I right with God, but is my church family right with God as well? Go with me to Hebrews 10, 25. Hebrews 10, 25, we opened it this morning. It's a reminder, verse 24, let us consider how to stir up one another to love and good works. You know what stir up means? You ever, you ever had a drink and all the stuff was at the bottom? And you want to make sure that it wasn't, it, it, it tasted right, what did you do? You stirred it up. Let's make sure that we stir up one another to good works. Not neglecting to meet together as is the habit of some, but encouraging one another. And all the more as you see the day drawing near. When Jesus is speaking to these churches, he expects a response. And these are the messages given to a flock of people that he knows that there are people there that can make a difference. My friends, you can make a difference. Wherever you are, whether it's in this church or another, you're accountable to the Lord and you're accountable to the body. You cannot be right with God if you go to a church and you sit at the seat and you get up and you walk away the same way you came in without any accountability to that church. You cannot stand before the Lord and say, well, at least I'm right with God. So am I my brother's keeper? Well, yes, actually I am. And we're accountable to one another. And that's the first thing I want to really stress before we continue. Amen? Amen. And in these letters, some churches, there were some churches that were doing some good things and some bad things. We've seen that over these last several weeks. And other churches like uh, Smyrna and Philadelphia, they were walking obediently and they were right with God. It seemed like they were doing everything right. And some churches like Sardis, they had wandered completely off the path. And they were not right with God. And Jesus here, just as he presents himself in a way that's unique to the circumstances of each of the churches at Ephesus and Smyrna and Pergamum and Thyatira, so also here Jesus presents himself to Sardis very specifically according to their circumstances as the one with seven spirits of God and the seven stars. That's verse 1. And we're familiar with the descriptor of Jesus as the one who holds the seven stars. We saw this with the church in Ephesus. Jesus describes himself as such, and we know that it refers to his authority over the churches. It is he who commands the churches. The church belongs to him and him alone. It's not my church. It's not your church. It's not our church. It's Christ's church. And we answer to him. He is the one who holds the seven stars in his hands. And now, Jesus presents himself as the one who has the seven spirits of God. And this speaks to the divine authority of Jesus, and it reflects the prophecy of Isaiah chapter 11. And there in Isaiah 11, verse 2, we read about how the sevenfold spirit of God will rest on the Messiah. And there it says that this Messiah will carry the spirit of the Lord, the spirit of wisdom, the spirit of understanding, the spirit of counsel, the spirit of strength, the spirit of knowledge, and the spirit of the fear of the Lord. And why does Jesus present himself this way as a sevenfold spirit? And it's because Jesus tells them, I know your works. You have the reputation of being alive, but you're dead. See, there's only one way in which something that is alive becomes dead. And that way is when the spirit 
leaves the body. Show me a person without a spirit, I'll show you a person who's dead or a zombie. Either way, they're dead. And this church was dead because the spirit of God had left the body. Where was the spirit? Sure, there were some individuals who were still faithful. There were some who here that Jesus said had not soiled their garments. But remember what I told you. The church, the body was without the spirit of God. What good did it do if there were a few individuals that were walking right with God? If the fellowship, if the church was not right with God. And that is why Jesus presents himself as the one who holds the seven stars and the seven spirits of God. And this is how Jesus is saying it. I not only come to you as the divine authority over the church, but as your only hope for life. You're dead because you no longer have my spirit there. And I am the one who carries the seven spirits of God. So if you have any hope for revival, not really revival, but resurrection, I am your only hope. I am the one who carries the spirit that your church desperately needs. But what happened? What happened to Sardis that it would be declared dead? How did Sardis die? What happened to it? And a lot of people may say, well, there's, Irby, there's really not a lot said there. We don't know what happened. Oh, yeah, no, we do know what happened. And I can answer it in one simple word. Sin. Sin killed this church. Romans 6, 23, for the wages of sin is death. James chapter 2, verse 20, faith without works is dead. And Paul says in 1 Timothy chapter 5, verse 6, that those who live for pleasure are dead, even while they live. So at least there's some spiritual zombies walking around. People with no life. And yeah, this church may have had the reputation of being alive. It was just an illusion. It wasn't real. We can look at a church today and we can see, oh, an impressive show. We can see fancy buildings and beautiful things going on there. But there may be a dark reality behind those doors. Not everything is as it seems. But the opposite is also true. The opposite is true as well. We may see a simple little church. Not much to look at, nothing really impressive, no TV contracts or extravagant displays, no gorgeous buildings when you walk in, but there you will find the Holy Spirit. There you will find living and active in its members, love and growth and Christ walking among them, people growing up in the image of God. Amen. And I don't care what a church looks like. I don't care what the church claims that it does. If the Spirit of God is not present, then it is dead. Yes, it is. There's an undeniable proof that the church in Sardis was dead. I told you, oh no, no, there's, there's plenty to see here that Sardis was dead and it was because of sin. But it's not what is said, it's what is not said. Let me give you the evidence that the church in Sardis was dead. Are you ready? Amen. This church was not dead under attack you may read some things here but let me notice here what is not said there's no mention of spiritual warfare there's no mention of tribulation there's no mention of suffering where is the persecution where is the hardship of the seven churches three received commendation and criticism some good things some bad things Ephesus <coughs> Pergamum and Thyatira. Two received nothing but praise. Smyrna and Philadelphia, you'll see soon. And two received nothing good, nothing but criticism. Laodicea and Sardis. Guess which two churches suffered no tribulation. Guess which two churches, go back and read them. There's no mention of suffering, no mention of persecution, no mention of any kind of attack happening on the church. Yes, you guessed it. The two that were found unfaithful to God. Those are the only two that are mentioned that suffered no tribulation. And guess which two were suffering the most tribulation. 
the two that received the most praise. That, my friends, is no, no coincidence. A church that is truly alive will always be under spiritual attack. Let me repeat that again. A church that is truly alive will always be under spiritual attack. If your church is not under spiritual attack, something is wrong. And boy, how is that running with a lot of the messages out there in the church? That would say, oh, look, you know, we're prospering, we're doing well. There's no major trials or tribulations. And they would say that that's a good thing. No, that's not a good thing. Because what we see faithfully in God's word is that those who follow Christ will encounter suffering and persecution and attacks because the enemy despises God's people. And the truth is that Sardis was so lifeless, so dead, that it wasn't even worth attacking. The demons would look to the enemy and they would say, they're Sardis. He goes, oh, they're no threat. In fact, they're doing me a favor. They're going out there and they're promoting exactly the opposite of what Christ really is. Leave them alone. In fact, throw them a few bones. They're good. Don't even attack them. Suffering for Christ is always a cause for rejoicing. If you're suffering Amen. for Christ. Now, if you're suffering for other things, sometimes, you know, we get what, what's coming to us. Sometimes we suffer the consequences of our actions. But when we're suffering for Christ, it's always a cause for rejoicing. Amen. Rejoice Amen. when you encounter suffering because the enemy comes against you. Be thankful to the Lord because it's evidence that you're doing the right thing. Don't despair. Don't get discouraged. Don't get down because things are not always going your way. If you're faithful to the Lord, it's evidence that God is with you, that you're being obedient and the enemy is coming against you. Some of you may say, I don't know, Irby. I, I hear this pastor on TV. He's from a church in Houston and, and he tells me the opposite. He says that I can have my best life now, that God wants me to be happy right now. Don't I want to have my best life now? No, that's exactly what the enemy would say. Because that speaks to the unregenerative heart. It speaks to exactly what the flesh wants to hear. Don't you want to experience your best life now? Not next life. No, now. You don't need to suffer. God wants you to be happy and, and without any problems or sufferings. But what does Jesus say? Go with me to Luke chapter 6, verses 24 to 26. Luke 6, 24 to 26. <clears throat> I would love, if I were invited to preach at that church in Houston, see, see what y'all can do. Can y'all can y'all maybe email and see if y'all can get me there? Let me tell you what I'm going to read to them. Luke 6, 24 to 26. But woe to you who are rich, for you have received your consolation. Woe to you who are full now, you know, your best life now, for you shall be hungry. Woe to you who laugh now, for you shall mourn and weep. Woe to you when all people speak well of you. For so their fathers did to the false, to the false prophets. Yeah, Sardis had a reputation for being alive. And all the people spoke well of them. Oh, man, Bob over there from that church in Sardis, man, he's a good guy. You can invite him to your festival. They're good, man. They'll, they'll conform. You, you need them to, to burn incense to the emperor? No problem. They get along with everybody. Everybody loves them. They they play the game. They, they get along with everybody. Oh, everybody spoke well of them. But let me tell you what they were living. They were living an inoffensive Christianity. If you are truly living obediently for Christ, you will be offensive. But if you walk in this world conforming and trying to fit with everybody, you're nothing more but an inoffensive Christian. And there's no such thing. That's an oxymoron. Like jumbo shrimp. Or military intelligence. It'll be nothing but an oxymoron. I'm an inoffensive Christian. No, that's, that's not a Christian. The true faithful follower of Christ will be, by definition, offensive to this world. But this church in Sardis was filled with nothing but inoffensive Christians. They just played the game. And the truth is, the church in Sardis was dead because the spirit was absent. And so Jesus instructs them, notice in verse 2, wake up and strengthen what remains and is about to die 
for I have not found your works complete in the sight of my God. There was still time. There was still hope. It wasn't over yet, but whatever work they had started was now incomplete. It remained undone. The church had started at Sardis had unfinished business. They had deviated from the good work, but they had forgotten their mission. When they forgot the gospel, when they forgot about Christ crucified, when they forgot about the reason and the purpose for their salvation, they forgot who they were. And soon, this church was doing nothing but walking on its own corpse. Walking on its own corpse and living off of its own reputation. No different than Toys R Us, or Oldsmobile, or any other business that was living in its glory days. Hey, Bob, you remember? Remember when we used to do these things? Remember when we did this and that? You're not going to hear me and Lee talking about, hey, uh, Lee, do you remember when we did Shameless? No, we're talking about Shameless 2 now. You don't hear me and Val talking about, hey, do you remember when we used to do the harvest? No, we're talking about the harvest now at Timber Hill and, 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 and whatever the Lord brings us in the future. Amen. And now at the at the, uh, at the Westover Hills, I went late. We have work to do. We don't have time to, to relish in the glory days. The glory days are here, they were then, and they are tomorrow. Jesus says to them, wake up. It is insufficient what you've done. It's incomplete. They needed to wake up. And I want you to understand something here. Your stance before God. Remember I told you the fundamental question is, is Lord, am I right with you? That question must be answered in the here and now. Lord, am I right with you today? David, who was a man after God's own heart, found himself one day not right with God. It can happen to any of us. Our past does not exempt us from the present and much less the future. We can't come to the Lord and say, Lord, you remember what I did? No, no. How am I with you today? I don't get to live off the past. And maybe Sardis had been right with God at some point, but now it was dead and the reputation could not and it would not save them. Let me tell you a story that every citizen of Sardis would have known and that the church of Sardis would have immediately connected to when Jesus tells them to wake up. That instruction, wake up, can also be translated and probably more accurately, accurately arise and be watchful. Let me tell you a story. When this letter was written, Sardis was living in the shadows of its former self. It was walking on its own corpse, on its own ruins. You see, 700 years before, Sardis was the capital city of one of the greatest kingdoms of the ancient world, the kingdom of Lydia. And the wealth of Sardis at that time was legendary. The river that flowed out of it was filled with gold. Just the gold out of that made it so wealthy that it was esteemed as one of the great cities of the ancient world. And this city sat on top of a hill. And I brought a picture, by the way. It sat on top of a hill and with only one entry. And it was so well protected that most people believed that it was impossible to breach. And so here was this city on a hill here on the right. That on top of that hill, you couldn't, you couldn't reach it because it was just this big mountain. There was only one entrance. And the most famous king of Lydia was a king named Croesus. And Croesus was wealthy and he was arrogant. And one day, Croesus decided that he was going to wage war on the Persians. I'm going to take on the Persians. And so he decides to go and send his army across the river to engage Cyrus the king, the king of the Persians, and he was defeated. He was laid to waste. And whatever army remained, Croesus retreated back to the city of Sardis, and there he retreat, retreated behind the walls, and he took refuge 
trusting that this place was so impenetrable that Cyrus would do nothing as he laid siege to the city. But one night, Cyrus sent a small party of Persian soldiers to scale up the side of that mountain that was supposedly impenetrable. And when they reached the top, when they got over the wall, they found that nobody was awake, nobody was alert, and nobody was standing watch and guard over the city. So they just casually walked over to the front, opened up the doors, and let the army in, and Sardis was destroyed. They didn't learn their lesson. About 300 years later, another general, Antiochus, he comes and he again lays siege to the city, and again, the enemy soldiers scale that mountain. They came over the wall and they found everyone again sleeping and not alert and not watching. And after the second time that it fell, Sardis was never rebuilt on that mountain again. It was rebuilt at the base of the mountain. That's why you see the city on the left at the base of that mountain. And so there at the base of the mountain, the people would live and they would point to that mountain over there and we'll talk about how one day, how a long time ago, there was a time, once upon a time, Sardis was a great city. But because the people were found not watchful, it fell. Everybody knew that story. So when Jesus tells the church at Sardis to wake up and strengthen what remains, it's like pointing to that hill and saying, Church, do you remember what happened to that ancient city of Sardis? When the soldiers failed to do their duty, when they failed to keep watch over the city, that's what's going to happen to you if you don't wake up. You're under siege and you don't even know it. You're dead and you don't even know it. This church did not need a revival. It needed a resurrection. So Jesus gives them three commands in verse 3. Number one, remember what you received and heard. Then he says, keep it. And then he says, repent. It's a threefold instruction given in verse three. Remember what you received and heard. Keep it and repent. And when Jesus speaks of remembering what was received and heard, he speaks of the gospel. He speaks of himself. He speaks of the cross. He speaks of salvation. He says, I want you to remember upon which your church was founded. You've lost your way. And it's an undeniable fact that one of the easiest ways to go wayward and to get lost with God is when we forget. And that is why the Bible is loaded with instructions. Remember, remember, remember. And the verb tense here to remember is a continuous action. It's not just remember, but keep on remembering. And never allow yourself to forget. Every day, remind yourself. Every day, remember what I've done. Remember what God has done for you. Remember what God is doing for you. Remember the faith upon which your faith stands. Remember the gospel. Remember the cross. Every day, continuous. Never forget. Isaiah 46, verses 8 to 9. Remember this and stand firm. Recall it. To mind, you transgressors, remember the former things of old. For I am God and there is no other. I am God and there is none like me. Remember, recall to mind, remember the former things of old. Psalm 103, verse 2. Bless the Lord, O my soul, and forget not all his benefits. Amen. Today, we have a beautiful reminder in the Lord's Supper for we do this in remembrance of him. So if the church at Sardis wanted to wake up, it first needed to remember what mattered most. Jesus. Salvation. The cross. The gospel. And when Jesus instructs the church to keep it. He means that once they do remember, 
Once they are, again, invoked of the memory of the reason why they're there, to take hold of it, to grip it, to preserve it, to share it with others, and to never let go. And just like the verb to remember is a continuous action, so also the command to keep it is continuous. Once you remember it, keep it. Keep it as a cornerstone of your church. Don't you dare let go. You keep on gripping. You never move on from this. You never graduate from this. You take hold of that cross and you never let go. My brothers, that's what we're supposed to do. Every day. Every day. If you would start every day by taking a walk to the cross. You want, you want to maintain humility? I remember a person asking me one time, what's the secret to finding humility in your life? I said, every day wake up and in your mind take a walk to the cross. And you stand there at the foot of the cross every day and you remind yourself of why you're here, you'll never get arrogant, you'll never get proud. You want to retain your humility? You want to find a spirit of obedience and submission to God? Take a walk to the cross, that's all you need. There, whatever pride anybody has is shattered against the cross. And the third command Jesus gives is to repent. I wondered, why does the, the, the command to repent come last? Should they repent first and then do all these things? Doesn't repent come first? And I realized, no. No, it doesn't. A person cannot repent unless they first find conviction. And a person can't find conviction unless they first remember. Only in remembrance would the church of Sardis realize how far they'd fallen. Amen. Only then would they realize that they had compromised the world. Only then would they begin to see all the sin that they had allowed into the walls of the church and how they had forsaken what mattered most. So Jesus is basically saying to them, when you come to your senses, repent. Amen. You want to hear something really neat? The first two verbs here that I shared with you to remember and to keep, they're continuous. Now repent. Repent is one definite action. It describes a decisive moment when the believer realizes that they're not right with God and they immediately come back to the shepherd. Amen. That's true repentance. When you realize you're lost, it's that de decisive, definitive action. I need to get right. And Jesus warns them if they don't repent, when they least expect it, like a thief in the night, he's going to return and he's going to judge them according to their response. Like that fig tree in the Gospel of Mark. One day, here comes the Lord, and he comes to it hungry, looking for fruit. But all he found was leaves. A fig tree with leaves but no fruit. And it was cursed by Jesus and died. But Jesus closes with the promise. There were still a few names in Sardis who had not soiled their garments. And Jesus promises that they will walk with him in white. For they are worthy. Praise the Lord. To say that they had not soiled their garments is a reference yeah. To how these followers had not compromised their faith. Amen. Now, Sardis was famous for its wool. In fact, it said that it was at Sardis where the dyeing of wool was first invented. So the staining of garments would have been uh, very understood, especially in Sardis where wool and the staining of wool happened. But these were unstained cloths. But it refers to a person who had underwent baptism. Because in those days, when a person was baptized, they were given a white robe. And it's like Jesus is saying, when you were baptized and you <coughs> confessed me as Lord and Savior, you have not soiled that garment. That baptismal confession still remains true. You have been faithful to what you professed. You continue to hold me above the world. And in the ancient world, White robes stood for victory. When 
Roman cities, when they would go out to battle and they would have a victory, they would come back together and they would celebrate this Roman triumph and everyone would come together and they would all dress in white. And the, the victory was celebrated as the Herbs Candida, which means the city in white, the city of victory. Amen. And Jesus is saying, city of victory, man, you ain't seen nothing yet. He's saying, my faithful flock, there's a city of victory waiting for you. And you and I, we're going to take a walk down that road. When you and I are in that city of victory, you and I are going to take a walk down that street together. And Jesus knew the faithful by name. He wouldn't forget them. He says their names would not be blotted out of the book of life. They were names that Jesus would confess before his father and the angels. You know that to me, this is a terrifying statement. It's terrifying because it implies that there's going to be names that will not be found in the book of life. And that there's going to be names that Jesus will not confess before his father. The real question is not, do you know the name of Jesus? But does Jesus know your name? Can you stand here today with the full assurance the full confidence that on the day that you meet Christ, that you'll say, yeah, Jesus knows my name and I'm going to hear it confess before the Father. And you stand here today with confidence because that's really what matters. It's not whether you know Jesus, but whether Jesus knows you. Because even the de demons know Jesus and at least they shudder. And the final statement is equally terrifying. He who has an ear let him hear what the Spirit says to the churches. It's a final warning. It's a final warning that the church needs to wake up because there's enemies scaling its walls. And there's a shepherd here who's broken and fearful for this flock, saying, man, you're all in slumber. You're dead, and you don't even know it, but the enemy has come upon you. It's a last chance to a church that's dead and is about to meet judgment. And Sardis never repented. Sardis never woke up and never got right with God. That church died and it's now lost to history. And if we learn anything from Sardis is that without the spirit of God, we're dead. So what is God's message here? Be alert. Be ever watchful. Be ever faithful. You are accountable to one another. It's not just about you. It's about those around you. Guide, teach, protect, encourage, and ensure that your church crosses that finish line together. We're all in this together. May we always remember what we received and heard May we keep it. May we remain watchful until his return. Amen. Amen. Please stand with me. I just want to quickly, before we go to prayer, as we close here, I just want to ask a question that the Lord has put in my heart to ask. I want you to ask yourself, here and now, am I right with God? Amen. And as we pray, if you're not right, if you want to get right, today's your opportunity. Let me ask you, are those that the Lord has put in my life right with God? I don't get to stand before the Lord alone. Because I know that God is going to ask me, and where is your brother? And where is your sister? Am I my brother's keeper? Yes. Actually, yes, I am. And so today, as we close in prayer, whether it's yourself or whether it's someone in your life that you know is not right with God, I want to invite you to come forward and be bold. To come forward and say, Lord, I'm willing to come forward 
and lift up this brother, this sister, to lift up this prayer. You don't need to tell me. You don't need to tell. You don't owe anybody an explanation. God knows your heart. God knows your petition. And so as we pray here, if the Lord has placed somebody in your heart that you know, that you know is not right with God, that you wonder if their name will be confessed before the Father and his angels, I invite you to come forward and say, Lord, there's someone in my heart. There's someone in my heart that I know is not right with God and you've given them to me to guide and to, to instruct. And Lord, I pray that you help me to do those things. So we go to the Lord in prayer. The altar is open. Lord, Father, I thank you, Lord, for this message. It's a reminder in this dead church. Oh, Lord, what good did it do that people would, would come to this place and they would do all the things, go through all the, the religious rituals, and yet they were dead inside. And Lord, Father, I thank you that your spirit is here. This church is living and active, not because of what we do, not because of who we are, but because of who you are. Because your spirit lives and dwells here. Lord, Father, may your spirit always be here. May we always grip it, hold on to it, keep it. May we always remember, remember the reason for the hope that we have. Lord, it is, it is the cross that brings us here. It's the cross that binds us. It's the cross that gives us this, this, this strength and this hope. Lord, may this church always, always be founded on that foundation. And Lord, may we always be watchful. May we always guard against the enemy. May we always be willing to protect and to guide. And Lord, today we see here to get together, we come before you, Lord, and we say, Lord, there is someone. Lord, there's someone, Lord, that is not right. And Lord, I pray that you guide me and help me and protect me and show me, give me the words and the wisdom, Lord, to guide this person, to speak the truth in love and to ensure, Lord, that they are with me on that glorious day. Lord, I don't want to just walk that street of victory with you. I want to walk it with them as well. Lord, you call me to love my neighbor. Who is my neighbor? Those around me, Lord, Father, you've given me people. And Lord, it's not just about me crossing the finish line. It's about ensuring that my loved ones do as well. So Lord, Father, here we stand before you, Lord, in complete submission to you, acknowledging that you hold, you are the only one who holds the power of salvation. Lord, may you guide us in this. May, the, may this church always be alive in you. May it always remember its first call. And may it never deviate from that call. May the cross always stand front and center in this church as the hope and the only hope of salvation. Lord, I thank you for this day. For those who are here, I thank you in Jesus' name. I want to thank you for being here with us and to our visitors and uh, not so uh, visitors visitors that have been gone for a little bit but are really part of our family and been for a while for all of you we're glad that you're here we're glad that you're sharing with us we're glad that you are here worshiping with us may you be blessed this week and you stand dismissed god bless you